sometimes the number of steps here, okay guys? So please give your attention to Kayla. Oh, and also, questions are at the end. That's why you have writing utensils, okay? Write down all your questions, dig them to the end, let Kayla finish the pre presentation, and then we'll have lots of time at the end to answer questions, okay guys? Are there gonna be any skill testing questions? Yeah. <laughs> 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 Yeah, I don't know how long it's going to be. Okay. I'm just going to do this presentation, and then we'll take a little break, right? People go to the bathroom or whatever. And then uh, I'll answer whatever questions you guys might have, be it about the presentation or anything else. All right? Okay. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, thank you guys for coming. This is great. I didn't think this many people would show up, but uh, I'm humbled and glad to see everyone here. Obviously, we all want to learn about the law. Right? A lot of stuff has been happening. I don't need to say any more, but things are being revealed. We're starting to see that the world is not what we think it is. A lot of this knowledge is hidden from us, right? On purpose, because they want to keep us down. They want us to not know anything so they can control us and do whatever we, they want with us kind of thing, right? So, I'm going to be bringing up the Bible a lot. This is, <laughs> it's not a religious talk. It has nothing to do with religion. It's strictly about the law, okay? I'm not trying to convert anybody. I'm just going to show people what the Bible is mean, what it means, what it's trying to tell us, and how it's a supreme law. And I think uh, you guys will just have to like, come to your own conclusions and obviously don't believe anything I tell you. Do your own research, come to your own conclusions, and uh, with that, let's get started. All right, so what is the law? If you break it down, you got L for land, which is common law. Air, which is like the more spiritual side, the ecclesiastic and trust law. And water, maritime admiralty law. And I'll be touching on a bit of all of that today, because pretty much if you want to get anywhere, you have to have like some knowledge about all three, because they all work together. All right. So I don't know if you guys could read this. I'll read it to you. <laughs> so this is made by my good friend Laura, who is very uh, well-versed, more than anyone I know, maybe. She's been researching for 20 years, and this is probably the best chart I've ever seen in regards to this. At the top, we got God. And God made man, and man made government, right? Man made government to serve man, not to rule over us. So that's what they're here for. And here you got the de jure government, which means the true government. And I'll show you that at the bottom, we have our Canadian government, our municipalities, right? That's called a de facto government. They're really a corporation masquerading as government, right? So they deal in what we call, well, there's a lot of words for it, like all this right here in this bottom section underneath the de jure government would be Roman civil law, maritime admiralty law, contract law, that kind of stuff, the legal fiction, right? Over here, where we have man and de jure government, that's where we have common law. So it's pretty hard for us to act, actually access the true common law in Canada because we're a corporation, so they keep us here. And at the very top, we got God's law, which is trust law, right, is the spiritual side. The very bottom, this is where they keep you, the human beings. Citizens, persons, residents, CPR. That means you're dead. You're actually here, right? This is where your power lies, but they want to keep you here. Okay, next slide. So like I said, um, God, man, government, corporation. So the creation can never supersede the creator, right? In movies, they show us a lot, like, such as The Matrix, they created AI, AI enslaved the world. Total fiction, that can never happen. It's something to keep us in, like, a state of fear. Same with Terminator, same idea, right? Skynet mm -hmm. takes over and enslaves us. But meanwhile, our creation, which is the government, has somewhat enslaved people. And that's because we don't know how the law really works. 
So anyways, God created man and gave him dominion over the earth, over the law. So God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, there's your water, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, and over all the earth. So L-A-W, we have dominion over the law and every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So that comes into play too. And I'm going to explain that. Does anyone know what I'm referring to when I talk about the creeping thing that creepeth? Anybody want to guess? Satan, the serpent, right. Next slide. So, man created government to serve mankind and to administer equity and justice. The crown, monarchy, is the true government known as the de jure government. And Queen Elizabeth, in 1953, I think it was, swore an oath to uphold the King James 1611 Bible, which makes the Bible a contract and which makes it the supreme law, right? So she upholds it militarily, like it's serious, right? Nothing supersedes the Bible in terms of the law. That's why she's known as the defender of the faith. And yeah, like I said, in the crown, in the de jure government, that's where we have our common law, which deals with due process, restoration, equity, all the good stuff that we all deserve, that we're not seeing right now. So I like Romans 13. Um, these are uh, some of my favorite parts of it that just kind of... Romans 13, it sums up the law, God's law, right? It talks about the Ten Commandments and just how to actually, you know, be within God's law. So, number one, verse one, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained by God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. Right? No. Owe no man anything, verse 10, but to love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. So that's the true law. Love thy neighbor as thy brother. Treat everybody as you want to be treated. That's really how it goes. And that's, we already know that deep down. We already know that stuff. We don't need all these legal fictions telling us how to behave and things like that. All right? How about the verse that goes, and by their masks we shall know them? Pardon me? How about the verse that goes, and by their masks? By their masks? Ooh. <laughs> by their masks we shall not know them. my laser pointer. It's okay, I don't need it right now. Okay, so Adam and Eve, we're going to start at the beginning. Things are going to get a little bit weird, right? <laughs> yeah. Here we go. Okay, so Adam and Eve, they live in the Garden of Eden that God created for them. Everything is in abundance, right? They don't need to hunt for food. They don't need to work. All the animals live in harmony with each other. They don't have to like look over their back and be worried about getting eaten, right? So what happens? There's a tree of life amidst the Garden of Eden, right? And then there's also the tree of knowledge. So God told Adam and Eve not to eat from the tree of knowledge. So these trees are not, you could say it's like a tree and they ate, picked a literal fruit and ate it, but that's kind of like, the literal definition of it but that's not what it is it's very symbolic what it is is the tree of life is the house of the creditor which is what we should be as man and the tree of knowledge is the house of the debtor so then they enter the legal fiction they become the dead fiction right and the serpent tempts them into it right so that's why God says when you eat from that fruit tree or that tree of knowledge you will surely die Right? So they become the dead fiction. And Satan, the serpent, tells them, you will surely not die. He's like, come to my world, right? The world of the dead. And that's exactly what happened. The knowledge means the acknowledgement. Do you acknowledge that you are now the debtor, the trustee? Right? So that's what happened there. 
So in the Bible, we see the word sin a lot. In our modern day culture, we refer to it as debt. So on the spiritual side, sin is like uh, the spiritual debt. Every time you do something wrong, you've committed like kind of a, you create a karmic debt, basically. I'll put it that way. So we refer to it as money, economic, right? Adam is a representation of mankind. He's not just one man, although in the Bible it depicts him as one man, but he's also, he represents all man. Ben Adam? People, right, okay. Oh, Ben, so like the son of the people, son of man, son of Adam, right. And the serpent, Satan, devil, that's the adversary of God. That's the opposite, right? They're in competition. They're trying to do what God doesn't want, right? The yin and the yang. Okay, so I'm going to start with the trust law trinity. So Adam and Eve, that story is pretty much setting up of the trust. God tells them to name all the animals, so the trust has been created. Adam is the beneficiary, right? So there's three parts of trust law. You got the executor, grantor, that's the one who creates the trust. The trustee manages the trust, they're the employee, the workers, right? The servant. And the beneficiary is the one who benefits from the trust. So when you were born and registered via the birth certificate, a trust account was created in your name. So God intended you to be the beneficiary, but you are instead made into the trustee. So we see that the corporate world mirrors the spiritual world, right? So everything starts off as spiritual, and then what we have is a perversion of it, the upside down mirror, the backwards inversion perversion of it. So God's law entails a three-party contract. Oops, sorry, I missed that part. Corporate law uses also a three-party contract, right? The Trinity between the directors, which is the executor and grantor, who direct their employees, the trustees, for the benefit of the stockholders, the beneficiaries, right? That's how all corporations work. That's how a trust works. So here in, in the spiritual realm, God's law entails a three-party contract between our Father, God, who operates through the Holy Spirit for the benefit of His Son, Jesus Christ. So uh, I recommend, this is a really good book here, it's called Be the One to Execute Your Trust by uh, David Robinson. He does a good job explaining trust law. He puts it in a very simple way. Anybody wants to learn more about that, I highly recommend that book. And other books of his, he puts things in a very concise and easy to understand way. For anyone trying to uh, learn. Yes, Kate. Just a quick question. Are you in the handout you're looking out at the end? Is this all the slides? Well, I could do that. I could just send the whole you know, PowerPoint presentation. And we're recording this too, so I could send you the video. And um, what else? Yeah, I'm going to like send you like YouTube videos and entire channels that you could benefit from. Recommendations of books, right? Uh, Laura's chart that she created so you could like study that in detail. There's a lot of detail there and a lot to look over Right, so you get the high quality version of that. Just make sure that you give your email to Christelle here my secretary (laughs) If anybody hasn't I think we got like 20 people on there, but it seems like there's a lot more than 20 so remember to Yeah Or after I'm done talking before we do the question part. Okay Anyways next slide So there's the top of Laura's chart again So we're going to talk about, I think what we're going to talk about now is, uh, I forget what slide comes next. Oh, oh yeah. So this is the real world over here. God, man, du jour. And at the bottom, the thing that creepeth is about to come and take over. Yes? What is the actual term for I would just say the real government, the true, the true government. I don't know. Who's good at it? It's Latin, right? The lawful one. Right. Yeah. That's what we have in Canada, right? Okay. Next one. Yeah, all the world. It is a one world government already. They're telling you it's coming, but it's already here. 
anybody who's got a Federal Reserve Bank in their country is participating in it, whether they like it or not. But I mean, I mean you've seen the, the color coding season for this COVID thing. It's the same in every country. That could only mean a one world. What do you mean by the color coding? Like, you know, the blue, green, yellow zone. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Lockstep. They're all moving yeah. together. Three phase lockdown. Yeah. It's a one world government. We could see it now. 2020, the veil was lifted. We all have 2020 vision now. We could see what's going on. We could see it for what it is. Right? Yeah, people are waking up. And if they haven't yet, I don't know what to tell them. Like, it's going to be really hard. <laughs> Too bad. So sad. It is pretty sad. Anyways, so the Vatican, that I can. If you break the word down, that means the holder. So they come and they say, I can hold the debt, right? So they come and they hold the debt. They take over the debt for everybody, right? Because man creates debt and credit. Every time credit is created, on the other side, there has to be debt, right? There can't be one without the other. It has to, the books have to be equal, right? So holder of the debt, debt of man. They are the beast of burden, the serpent, the usurper, and the thing that creepeth. So the Vatican is that snake. Right? That came from below. So, like I said, they volunteered to hold the debt. And why would anyone want to do that? Why would anyone want to hold the debt? It's because uh, the serpent um, is the beguiler, which is the charmer or trickster. They know how to confer the debt back to man. Right? We're not supposed to have debt. But they give it back to us. They make us pay again. Right? Our, our trust that's created when we're born pretty much should cover everything that you need to live a good life. And everything is already paid for, right? Because we, you know, we live in the country of Canada, the true country, the terrain part of Canada. So we, we deserve the, the minerals, the, the energy, the resources of Canada, right? Because God gave us dominion. So the Vatican created Babylon. And Babylon in the Bible today is known as the world of commerce, which is the matrix, right? The de facto government. That's the, the ones who enslave us all. They tell us one thing, but it's something else, right? So if you watch TV, you're in the matrix, right? If you're sending your kids to school, now we know. Like these government institutionalized schools, you're in the matrix. They're not going to teach you anything of worth. They're going to teach you how to be a slave, right? Homeschooling. <laughs> okay, so the illusionary world that has blinded us in order to keep us as a debt slave as they harvest our energy. They're also the first bank, right? The bankers, the Rothschilds, those are the serpents. If you want any further proof, this building here is in the Vatican, right? This is a Pope. John Paul the Sixth, or Pope Paul the Sixth, I think it is. Hall, the Pope Paul the Sixth Hall. And it looks like a snake, as you can see from the inside. You can see the fangs, and the the speaker will stand literally right in between them. Yeah. What are they trying to tell us, right? And they got like a really crazy sculpt of Jesus. I don't have the image here, but if you look up the image of Jesus that they have from here, it's very. Blasphemous is the only word I could really think of to say. Okay. I'm sure you, all, you guys all have a driver's license. If you have a driver's license right now, I want you to take it out and take a look at it. Take a look at this part right here. There's a little hologram over there. It's got your name, Odin. <laughs> so this here is the Vatican, right? within Rome. This is Vatican City. Look at the shape of it. It's a key. Right? They got that same shape on your driver's license. They're telling and they got your signature. They got your head. They beheaded you. They entered you into their dead fiction world. You're beheaded. Right? You guys see the hologram? I oh, know it's kind of dark in here. And there's the number, right? There's your registration number on your driver's license. Wow, mind blown, right? 
<laughs> okay, next slide. So back to the matrix, right? This is everything in the fake world. With the Vatican on top, right? You got the secret societies running things. You got the private banks. You got the think tanks. I'm not going to go over all this with you guys. I'll let you guys check it out on yourself and really explore. This is pretty good. Like the detail on this one is amazing. You got your media. You got institutional religions, which are also corporations, right? And then here you got the human beings. And I'm going to talk about the word human beings later because we're not really human. We're man, right? All right. So the birth certificate. We are not actually members of countries, but members of a corporation. We have been captured in maritime law since the birth, since our birth, and are lost at sea until we correct our standing and find ourselves back on the land as a living man. Right? So when you're born, the water breaks. So I'm going to use a lot of water terminology here to show you how you're on the water. You are shipped, delivered which mean the same thing. When somebody gets something delivered, they get it shipped, right? Through the birth canal by the dock. Your mother, as the informant, puts you into a form and into the registry. So when anything gets registered, it means it's not yours anymore. You hand it over, right? The hospital bond gets created, monetized, and sold to the Vatican, Vatican or some government entity, right? So when the doctor births you, he kind of holds you up and he takes you away from the mom and then they do whatever they do. They remove that waxy substance on you, on you which is actually good for you and that's supposed to stay on you. Vernix. It's really good for your skin. That should stay on you for as long as possible, right? They take it off right away. They take you away from the mom. They don't give you to the mom to bond with the mom as you should to create that eternal bond, right? They created a separate bond, right? And when they do that, then they give you back. They gave my mom the wrong one. They gave your mom the wrong one? <laughs> oh. She's like, wait a minute. All oh, right. She recognized you right away. Wow, okay. So all babies don't look the same. <laughs> Right on. Okay, well, it's a good thing she recognized. <laughs> wow. Imagine. You'd be somewhere else. <laughs> okay, so anyways, you become the bonded surety, right? That means you become the collateral for this corporation that was just created. And you take on the debts of the country, right? So that's, I say you take on the debts of the country the sin of the country. And remember, everybody probably here has a sin card. So that, right? Another mind-blown moment. <laughs> yeah, you don't want that. You don't want anything to do with that sin card. Next slide. So, so the mother creates the matter. That's where the word mother comes from, right? Maternal. And the father creates the patent, paternal. Right? So only females can create matter. So the father gives the patent, right? The patent is the surname. It's patented now. That surname is not really yours. Your last name doesn't belong to you. It doesn't belong to your dad. It doesn't belong to your grandfather, right? You're just borrowing that, right? You don't own title to it. And that's one of the ways they bond you to the system. When they combine your given name with the surname, they create that fictional corporation, which will be in all caps, and I'll get to that. So, yeah, like I was saying, your given name, which is your Christian name, combined with the last name, surname, in all uppercase text, creates a corporation, a.k.a. what is known as a straw man. So now you are a citizen on the citizenship, where you are lost at sea. So the birth certificate is used to create your bank accounts, driver's license, health card, and your social insurance number. So what, a word, what the word human really means is uh, from Valentine's Law Dictionary, 1948 edition, human being is defined as C, 
see monster. That means go look at the word monster, <laughs> right? So anyways, you go and you look up the word monster. I don't mean see monster. I mean like go look at the word monster. Look that up, right? So you go look up monster, defined as a human being by birth, but in some part resembling a lower animal, right? So you're always through media, through school, through just the way we speak to each other, we have it in our brains to call each other as like human beings, members of the human race, right? As if we're all racing against each other, climbing over one another to, to win, the rat race kind of thing, right? But the word human is never in the Bible. That's kind of a made-up thing that they pinned on us, right? Same as citizen, person, which means persona, right? That's the, the corporation. Actually, in uh, Latin, persona, person, it means a mask, which is kind of funny right now because everybody's walking around wearing a mask, acting as if there's some kind of deadly virus. So we're all in an act right now. We're all participating in some giant movie. And I guess some people, their life is so boring that they think it's the most <laughs> wonderful thing that we're all <laughs> in a movie right now, right? And we're all acting. And people get pissed at us who know it's like all fake. They get angry at us, right? I'm sure everyone here has probably experienced it at some point, whether it's family, friends, some random stranger. So yeah, citizen, person, resident. Resident means you're on land that doesn't belong to you. So the word hue, right? It means a color or shade or a character or aspect or a form or appearance. So human means resembling a man or the hue of man or man under the color of law. Actually, one, one interesting thing, I'm going to talk about The Wizard of Oz because uh, that movie was created by a very high-ranking Freemason, okay? And they're showing us a lot. So it starts off in black and white, right? She's in the real world, black and white, and then she goes into the world of color, the fake world, the legal world, the color of law, right? And then she follows the yellow brick road, which is the money, follow the gold, it takes you to the Emerald City, which is like, you know, the green. And uh, she meets the straw man, right? That's your straw man. That's your corporation. The tin man, the tax information number, and the cowardly lion. That's like, he's supposed to be the lion hearted, the brave one, right? But he's a coward because he doesn't know anything. And he's scared of everything, right? Yeah. And uh, so anyways, eventually, she finds out the Wizard of Oz, which is supposed to represent the government, is not as big and scary and powerful as she thought, right? The veil gets pulled back. The veil gets pulled back, right? It becomes revealed. It's just an act. It's a magic show. And she sees it for what it's worth, and she's no longer tricked, right? Otherwise, Jewish guy? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Maybe he is. So the, what the Wizard of Oz would have had her doing, right? He promised her she could go home. But he keeps doing, making her do all these meaningless tasks. And she would have kept doing them over and over, and she would have never got home. Just like they make us do in real life. They're just making us work every day, right? You wake up, you go to work, and where are we getting with that, right? So anyways, maritime admiralty law. So maritime law governs ships on the sea. Admiralty law governs the terms and conditions, which are the statutes, on the ships. Corporations are fictitious ships governed by the law of the sea. <clears throat> if you agree to be a corporation, you are subject to statutes, legislations, codes, acts, bylaws. So I'm here to tell you that you won't have anything to fear with any of these, like Bill C-36, that kind of thing, right? You got 36, you got 36, so they're kind of telling you, right? Mark of the beast right there. That has no effect on you as a living man or woman. Okay, it only has to do with the corporation people, the people who think that they're subject to all this. So unless they figure this out, they're going to be scared. They're going to think all this stuff, that the military is going to come to your door and say, okay, we're going to force jab you now, right? We live in a consent-based universe. Everything is by consent. Nobody's going to hold you down and jab a needle into you. You have to go up to them, whether you're scared or whether you think it's the right thing to do and say, okay, give it to me, right? They're not gonna hold you down and do it. So, yeah, these are the colors of law. 
and they do not apply to a man. Only God's law applies to a man, which I refer you back to Romans 13. Read that. It's very, uh, it's not very long. It's very to the point, and you'll see how God's law really works in that one chapter. All right? So back to this one. Now I hope you can see where you really are and where they're trying to keep you. Okay? Know that you're up there and you're not subject to the Vatican and all their debts. So the Old Testament starts out with the book of Genesis, which, like I said, Adam and Eve are with God in the garden, right? Life is as it should be. And then the fall happens, and then they start to move away from God into the world of Babylon. So the Old Testament talks about being with God and slowly moving away. And the New Testament, when Jesus Christ is introduced, they're taking you back to God, right? And then at the end, right, we have the book of Revelation, Babylon falls, okay? So the good guys win in the end. And I'm of the belief that right now we are watching the book of Revelations play out. So things might get a little worse before they get better. So <clears throat> Christ came along in the New Testament and said, In my name only will you be saved. Jesus died for our sins, meaning our death. So if you use a Christian name, ditch the surname, or at least know how to use it, then you become debt free. Right? You stop taking on the debts of your corporation country that they've enslaved you in. So the difference between the Christian name, which is a fact, and the surname, which is a fiction. The surname, why do they call it a surname? It's because it's a surety name. It makes you the surety, which bonds you as a debt slave. Right? You're born into bondage, like in the Matrix, which explains a lot. Watch that movie again, now knowing this, and you'll start to like, things will make sense to you. Right? You're born into the matrix and they harvest your energy. So it's also known, the surname, as the serpent name, the servant name, the serf name, which means slave. The Christian name, Christian creditor. Right? Easy way to remember it. Christian creditor. Surname, the debtor. So Jesus walked on water and showed us how to properly operate in commerce and to be the creditor instead of the debtor. What he always did was he would always answer a question with a question, putting the burden back on the other side. So he's telling you how to deal with people, right? So, for example, Luke 20, for example, the Pharisees who hate Jesus, they're always trying to trip him up, right? They ask him a question. He'll respond, I'll answer your question if you could answer this. So he's answering with a question. And so they go and they huddle and they come back and they say, well, if we say yes, then we incriminate ourselves. But if we say no, then we're lying. So we can't answer that. So his response will be, neither am I required to answer you, right? So I'm just gonna bring up vaccines because I know it's on everybody's mind. Employers are forcing right now their employees to get the vaccine. One easy way to respond Ask them, can you prove to me there are no metals in this vaccine, that it's actually safe with legit proof? Can you assume liability? If anything happens to me, you owe me $10 million or something like that, right? You're making them a conditional offer. They'll never agree to that. Everything is an offer in this world, right? Yeah, well, nobody wants to, right, nobody wants to be liable for that. Of course, insurance won't cover it. And when you go and you take the vaccine, you pretty much, you waive your life insurance, right? You sign your life away. So in commerce, the one who answers the question assumes the debtor role, and the one who asks the questions assumes the creditor role. So he who makes the claim bears the burden of proof. So you always want to put that on the other person, right? Always answer with the question. I think that's it. All right, break time.